Okay, so this one's fairly simple. You see the tangent lines, okay? But how do we define a tangent line? You might as well touch this one. Right. And it's that, that limiting process as we let h go to zero approaches that tangent line. Wouldn't that mean the greatness of a tangent line would be a secret line though? Because of this point here? Yeah. Yeah, I realize that can be confusing, but. Huh? I thought that was only the red line. Oh, there's two. There's a green one too. I still thought the red one wrong too, so it doesn't really matter. Okay. <laughs> well, um, yeah, it, this seems like it would be a secant line, but you've got to. Just focus on this one area, you know, at the point that we're talking about. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So just locally, is. right here, because you only touch it one place. Well. Or, or another way to think of it is, if you zoom further and further and further in, uh, closer and closer and closer to that section of the graph, that section that you see will become closer and closer and closer to the tangent line. If you zoomed in on the top of this curve, you would get this flatter and flatter and flatter and flatter line as you got closer and closer and closer, right? Yeah. So that's another way to think of it as well. Um, so whatever happens with this tangent line at other parts of it, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah, I get it. Okay. So just to, it won't cross through that point. So, uh, well, let's start with this green one, okay? What's the slope of the green one? Zero. zero. The slope of a horizontal line is zero. It's simple. It, the rise of the run, okay, we start at this point. Then we go up, but we don't go up. If you go up, you're, you're not going to be able to move over to get to the line. So you don't move up, you can move over as much as you want. So a rise of zero and a run of whatever gives you a zero slope. Now, this red one. Uh, like we said, anything close to five halves would be fine. I just personally picked this point, and then I looked for another intersection, that point, you don't necessarily have to use the point that's on the graph, you can use points that are just on the line. So if we use this, it's up one, two, three, four, five, and over two. So we can say approximately five halves. If you got two, two would be good. Like if I did use this point, it looks like I do move it down about two and over one and get to like a, a similar place. So that's pretty close. I think five halves is probably more accurate. Okay. Uh, we're gonna need this groove to work on this guy here. So this two. So we're going to find the slope of the, the line tangent to the graph of the function at the given point. The only way that we know how to do that, of course, we're going to make this faster. We, we, we've got to find faster ways to do this. But for now, we use this right here. That's how we find the slope. <laughs> All right. So we got f of x plus h minus f of x, or h of t plus h minus h of t. Right. So we have h of t. We always have h of t. And that's always going to be that second part. So the next thing would be to find h of t plus h. What does that mean, h of t plus h? Put t plus h where the t is at. I know it feels strange and it's sometimes difficult to take something and put it in place of t, especially when that thing has a t in it already. You, know, you want to do t squared plus h, you just want to squeeze in a plus h next to the t and things like that. But you've got to see it for what it is, and that's putting t plus h into every place that has a t. And in this case, there's only one place. So we put t plus h in there, and we can square this. t squared plus 2th plus h squared plus 3. And there's our h of t plus h. <coughs> um, so 
h of t plus h is going to be t squared plus 2th plus h squared plus 3 minus h of t. Seven. What? Um, t squared plus 3. Oh, you're right, because we're at a specific point. So we don't want to leave these as t's. Great job. We want to use negative 2. So we'll put negative 2's in here. Negative 2 squared plus 2 times negative 2 times h plus h squared plus 3. 4 minus 4 uh, h plus h squared plus 3. Times 7. What? 7 is just h of, uh, of negative 2, right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, since our t is specifically negative 2, we need to put those specific values in there. So 4. Uh, or I see what you're saying. We can collect like terms here. Get 7 minus 4h plus h squared minus h of negative 2 is 7 over h. And we want to take that limit as h goes to 0. Well, 7 minus 7. Wait. Yes? Why is it 7 minus 4h plus h squared minus 7 here? Because the second minus 7 is. This is h of negative 2 plus h. Oh, okay. And this is h of negative 2. Um, and so the 7s mm -hmm. cancel each other out. Okay. And now what we have is uh, a numerator where all the terms have h's in them. It's a, a factor of h. So we have uh, h times negative 4 plus 1. If we factor out an h for both of those, we get an h. The h is cancel. Okay, so we get the limit as h approaches 0. Uh, negative 4 uh, plus 1. Plus 1. Let's see. Plus h. h. Plus, oh, h. There is there. That makes more sense. Let's go down I love H's. testing you. Yeah. Ooh, feels so good. <laughs> okay, plus H. And then we let H be 0. Now this is not going to cause any problems. Negative 4. Whew. There's a lot of work to find the number negative 4. Mm. Isn't there patterns, though? Are there patterns? Yeah, like certain numbers always seem to get crossed out. Like yes. Like the t squared portion that always gets canceled. The t squared? Like the leading what degree function, I guess you could say. What do you mean? Like t squared plus 3. Yeah. Whenever you plug in uh, t plus h or t squared, like, and uh, trying to figure out how to do it. Like, you end up with t squared plus t. Like two th oh, when you plug a number in, yeah, then that squared portion always cancels. So this is like, uh, well, not the squared portion, but the squared portion plus the constant always seems to go away. Right? That's true. That always does happen. Um, Theoretically, if you get the function, you just figure out the patterns. That's, that's what the derivative function is. It's just we're recognizing that, hey, there are these patterns and there are these numbers that always get canceled out. So rather than doing that over and over for specific numbers, why don't we like, leave the variables in there, let those patterns happen in, in variable form rather than specific numbers, and at the end we'll, we'll basically have, hey, here's the pattern that, that all of these values go through. Right? Um, so yeah, this and if you if you think about it, you get that this uh, number plugged in for t plus the constant. Well, that's t squared plus three. That's just the original function. And what are we subtracting? We're subtracting uh, at h of t, which is t squared plus three. So the t squared is always going to cancel with this t squared from here, and this three is always going to cancel with this three. And that always happens. And that's where the, the idea of the derivative comes from. Any questions about this one? Nope. Yeah, that's all. Right. Uh, that's all. Oh. I'm gonna bring in another one of these.
That's clever. Did you think of that? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I should have said yes. Did you just spend all of last night looking for calculus jokes? No. That's what you did. <laughs> Nerd. <laughs> Where did you hear that? It's hours. Um, the internet. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Okay. So. It's a newfangled idea. The derivative. <laughs> okay. So, as uh, Gavin brought up, this, what we're doing here is noticing that there are these patterns and that these numbers, certain numbers, keep getting canceled out. And rather than do that process over and over, if we want to find several different slopes for some reason, uh, we leave the variables as variables. We don't plug numbers in, and then we see what happens. We get this new function. <coughs> so there we have f of x. We're always going to subtract f of x. But we also need f of x plus, plus h. h. Yeah. So uh, we're going to plug x plus h into every x that we see. So two times x squared, okay, that's going to give an x plus h. Plus x, that's going to give an x plus h. Minus 1. Minus 1. x plus h, x plus h. 2 times x squared plus 2xh plus h squared plus x plus h minus 1, 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared plus x plus h minus 1. All right, so there's f of x. Plus H. <laughs> no. No, I was thinking like what to do next. But then I thought I knew it, but I didn't. So I didn't go any farther. Oh. Well, this over is just H. F of X plus H. This is just F of X plus H. We have to do the minus. Minus F of X, which is two X. Two X squared plus, plus X minus one. Over H. Over H. Over H. Over H. Over H. Uh, is that H or zero? Thank you, Logan. <laughs> 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 All right. Oh, yeah. We couldn't do this without it. All year. Okay, we got 2x squared minus 2x squared. Yeah. Trying to save ourselves some And then you so have a... Minus x. You have a, yeah. Uh, x <laughs> minus x. And then a 1 and a negative 1. Negative 1, one, one, negative one minus one. negative 1. Yeah. All right. And then now all you got left is 4x h plus 2h squared h plus h over h's. Just cancel them out right now. Right now? Right now. Right now. Okay. 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 Now zero four goes in for one. H. Let's all do calm down a little bit. We don't want to rush four this thing. Wait, where's the one? Yeah, yeah, where is that one? This, so H cancels this H, you get 4X. H cancels one of these H's, you get 2H. H cancels this H. There's a one in front of it. Yeah, there's a one in front of it. When you're doing several steps at once, make sure you don't miss stuff like that. That's really common. You cross out the H and you're like, oh, yeah. it's gone. It's He's not missing it. He's okay. So we get this uh, this thing. What is this thing? Derivative. Derivative. The derivative, OK. How do I, this is how I tell you this is the function x. How do I write it down so you know that's the derivative? What notation do you have? Oh, that prime of x is 4x plus 1. So that's how you say it. So that f prime of x, I just gave the derivative. The derivative of the function f. It's just like negative 4, which is or would you just do yeah. Say again? So, okay. So if the answer is just like negative four, it's not yeah. a function, right. you still do x. Okay. If, if an answer, oh, if, if, the, if you do the derivative, mm -hmm. it comes out to b negative four, yeah. that's still f prime. Okay. 
It's, that's just, it's a function, it's just a constant function. The slope apparently will always be negative four. So apparently what you started with was a line. Because um, right? a line will always have that slope. So in this whole, like the section two, every time that they say um, chain x or delta x on the book, is that just chain h for us? Well, we, we wouldn't be fluent in, in all of these things and understand all these terms. Uh -huh. But yeah, it's the same as, as h. That's how we're using h. So we can replace this h with delta x, delta x. Okay. And this, f of x plus h, well that, f of something is a y value of a function. Yeah. And f of something also is a y value of a function. So this is yeah. apparently some y minus some y, which would be delta y. It'd be a change in y. This is just delta y over delta x. Okay. So f prime, that is the derivative. What is the derivative? It's a function that will tell you the slope at a, at a value of x of the, the function of which it's a derivative, right? Yeah. Okay. So the derivative of f will tell you the slope of f at whatever x value you plug in. If you plug that for x plus y and then the whole thing over again, like that same thing process, would it get back to 2x squared? Oh, that's an interesting question. If so if you if you did the same thing with this, you plugged that into this process. Yeah. Well, the answer is no. You wouldn't get back to that. But that's that's interesting. They're not inverses. <clears throat> that sounds like an inverse process. Um, if you were to plug this back into there, what you would get is called the second derivative. <laughs> take the derivative of the derivative. <laughs> you can take the derivative forever. Now there's some limitations to that. Um, so we'll talk about that today. What's that? Is that why it's calculus with limits? So no, it's, the it's calculus limits. with limits because we have limits. <laughs> I mean, for, for practically, uh, I mean, we can tell you how to find the derivatives of things without ever talking about limits, yeah. but you would lose yeah. so much of the understanding. Yeah. There are rules and there are procedures, and you can learn them, but you wouldn't um, know about the limits. It? Quotient function or something they do in the first chapter pre-calculus, isn't it the same? Mm -hmm. That is the quotient function. My little brother was doing his homework and I was just looking at that and then he was like, I couldn't figure it out, I could only figure out how to do the derivative part. Well, this, this part right here is yeah. the difference quotient. So what you do this and you just don't apply that would have been zero. nice to have been like, oh yeah, you're going to use this in calculus for five You can tell him tonight. So you could like prepare know. yourself. <laughs> What's it, Ryan, you have something? Would the second um, derivative be like even simpler than the derivative? Because yeah, this seems simpler than the first function, right? So the second one would be so the derivative. It sure seems like it would be. <laughs> you can try it out and see for yourself. No. Oh, you could do it. I'm going to do it. So wait, what was the point of going like to like the tenth derivative, say, or something? That's something we'll discuss. Okay. So now, but think of this. The derivative of a function tells you the slope, right? Correct. Okay, now, if this function were to actually represent the interaction of two things, like uh, if x were time and f of x were distance, okay? Well, we'd have uh, time this way and distance this way. We'd have a, if we oh, yeah, a graph, sense. right? So what would the yeah, slope of that graph represent? Oh, and I see the line. Let me, let me, let me draw it. We got a distance and a time, okay? This is, this is like our, our experiment that we did, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Distance above the ground, time that it took, or time that it was. Okay. So, in our example, the ball falling, rising and falling. What did the slope at each point represent? It's velocity. It's velocity, right? If we take the the sine into account, the positive and negative, we could call it velocity. Okay. So, the the slope tells you the rate of change between the two variables, right? The distance over time, okay? So this function is a function uh, that for a given time, instead of plugging in time and getting distance, you plug in time and you get what? You get velocity, okay? So if we took the derivative of this thing, and the derivative tells you about the rate of change, that's so key that you get that connection, that the derivative tells you the rate of change of the original function. So if this derivative, uh, if we were to use this as an example, were to tell you the, the, the velocity, right, the rate of change, the distance over time, 
Okay, so I put in I put in time and I get out velocity. If I took the derivative of that, well, that derivative would have to tell me a rate of change, right? A rate of change of what? The rate of change of the velocity. What is the rate of change of velocity called? Acceleration. Oh my goodness. Okay. It's amazing. We're, th that'll come up in, uh, in, a, in a couple of sections. But we keep taking the derivative, we're going to keep finding very useful things. We find, find a function that tells us the, the velocity, right? Even though we looked at it yesterday, not yesterday, but two, day, two uh, classes ago, I guess, or two days ago, one class ago. Uh, and we did get a, kind of a complicated quadratic function, but. Uh, if we took the derivative of that thing, we would now have a, a, a function that tells us the velocity of our ball. And if we took another derivative, we'd have a function that tells us the acceleration of the ball. Right? What is the acceleration of that ball? Or what should it be? Acceleration is a number, right? It's, it, it, it tells you how fast you're changing your speed, how fast you're speeding up or slowing down. Right? If you're going down the highway at 60 miles an hour, you're not accelerating. Your acceleration is zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're speeding up and you're increasing your velocity, your, your acceleration is positive. If you're slowing down, your acceleration is negative. What's the acceleration of something that is just in the air? With nothing else acting, what's the only thing acting on that ball? Gravity. Right. Gravity. Nothing else. Your push isn't acting on it. Nothing else is acting on it. Just gravity. So what's giving it its acceleration? Gravity. Gravity, right? Does gravity change? No. Mm, by a very, not, let's say no. Let's say right here, no. Is it just a rate? It's a rate of change of the velocity, yeah. Okay. Let's, let's finish this out real quick. The acceleration of gravity doesn't change, so it should be a constant. So if we took our function that tells us the position of the ball and take the derivative and find the velocity, take the derivative of that and find the acceleration, we would actually find it's just like 9.81 meters per second squared. That's about the acceleration of, of gravity on Earth. Uh, yeah. drop the bowling ball from the top of the skyscraper, wouldn't it drop faster and faster and faster? Like, yeah. if you took the, the velocity would be increasing. Yeah. But the acceleration would not be increasing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Acceleration, acceleration and then velocity. Yeah, it accelerates. That makes sense. Mm. Okay. It's we'll, we'll we'll get into it uh, in the future as well. But let's just stay with with this stuff. We're almost done with the, the quiz. I don't want this to take too long. Here. It's already taken kind of a long time. That's okay. Everything that we do with all the other Okay. So we're going to find the equation of the tangent line of the graph. Okay, what does the equation of a line look like? That might equal mx plus b. Like with mx plus b? It doesn't have to look like this. It could look like a lot of things. Remember, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. That was point slope form. Their standard form, we can write it as ax plus b y equals c. That's another way to write the equation of a line. But this is a real popular, convenient <laughs> form, right? Right. Um, so what do we need to know in order to find the equation of a line? M and b. We need to know m and we need to know b. Okay. So there's this, this guy right here. This looks like that. We want to find the slope of the line at 2 comma 5. So there's this line right there. There's a point. What point is on the line for sure? Uh, two comma five. And so what it looks like, we, we know a point, right? An x1 comma y1. That could be that. Can we find the slope also? Yeah. How do we find the slope? F of x plus h minus the Right, the limiting process, the difference quotient. Okay, so the slope we'll find by the derivative. <laughs> All right, so let's find the slope of, of this thing. Okay, so f of 
2 plus h, we need to find f of 2. We need to find f of 2 is just, well, this is kind of silly, f of 2 is 5. That's already done. Okay, f of 2 plus h will be 2 plus h squared plus 1. 4 plus uh, 4h plus h squared plus 1. Minus f of x, right? This is f of x plus h. Minus f of x over h. I'll take the limit as h goes to 0. 5 plus 1 minus 5. 4 plus 1 is 5. Minus 5 is h. This h cancels this and one of these. Get 4 plus h. Limit as h goes to 0. So we put 0 in here. We get a slope of 4. So will that be uh, not the slope? Yeah. So That's the like slope of the tangent line? So it will be like y equals 4x plus 0. So you plus something. Point on the line. Plus something. Yeah? What's that? I need another point on the line. Well, if we, wanted, if we were working with two points, that would be to find the slope, right? But we have the slope. So we could use point slope form, we could use slope intercept form. I think most people tend to choose this one. So here is y, and here is x, and here is m. Ooh. Right? So 5 equals m x plus b. Can we solve for b? And can we just uh, make y? Negative 3. So y equals 4x minus 3. Hmm. What's that? Solve for Oh, yeah, I see it now. And B is A. Okay, last one. This guy right here. Okay, remember that this graph here is going to be the graph of the derivative. And the derivative tells you the slope. This is going to represent how big the slope is at any x value. Wasn't the, wasn't the answer for 25 like. Wait, that's like 4 plus 6. Yeah, it's some weird stuff. Um, did it? Let's see. Uh, so your answer yeah, do the answer thing. Back of the book, you would find what we just found. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll I'll make sure it's right when I correct them. Right? Okay. So, hey, go ahead, calm down, everybody. So, um, the derivative, whatever one of these is the derivative, is going to represent how big the slope is at that x value. Okay. Let's let's start out here. Like, what kind of slopes are we seeing at this point? Very small. Small, close to zero. zero. Positive or negative? Positive. Okay, positive numbers that are close to zero out towards uh, five. Okay, so let's look here. Um, maybe this one's kind of close to zero, a slope of one. That's pretty small. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe that. Uh, but it looks like for this one, is the slope of whatever function this is the derivative of? Is the slope changing? No, no. Slope's always one. Is the slope always one here? No. Clearly it's not, so it couldn't be this one. These slopes are rather large. That's not gonna work out. Maybe this one, but let's get a little more information here, okay? So small slopes here. How do these slopes compare to these slopes? Larger. Larger, not a ton larger, but larger. How about the slopes here? Much steeper. Pretty big, big. How big are these slopes? Very large. Really, they're really big. They're, they rise a lot and don't go over very much at all. Mm. Okay, so we should have really big numbers here, and then getting smaller and smaller and smaller and approaching zero. Well, that looks like this guy right here. Big, big slopes, right? A large value on the derivative means the steep original function. And we come over here really steep, right? These are big slopes, so the original function must be really steep. Come over here, uh, slope of one right there, so Right there is about a slope of uh, you know 45 degree angle. Yeah, slope of one. 
Coming down here, slopes approaching zero. All right. Huh? All right, are you guys good? Do you have any questions? No. For the homework? Uh, 34. 34? Yeah, the math. Oh, yeah. Okay. Find the equation, hello, find the equation of the line that is tangent to the graph of f and parallel to the given line. It's 3x. What 3x? 3x. Minus x is okay. better, yeah. Let <laughs> me <laughs> scribble minus 1. <laughs> there you go. Wow. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> it's really so there's this, this function here, x cubed plus 2. Yeah. It's a curvy graph. All right. <coughs> and we want to find the equation of the line, of the tangent line, the y equals mx plus b for the line that's parallel to this line. What does parallel have to do with anything? Same slope. Same slope. Okay, so we should probably find the slope of this line. What do you think about that? Good. Yeah, right here. Okay, so let's put it in y equals mx plus b. Yeah. So y equals 3x minus 4. So m is 3, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so we need the slope of the tangent line to be 3. Okay, well, how do we find the slope of that graph over there? What tells us the slope? The function. The derivative. You find the derivative of this function, you find a function that tells you the slope. Okay? And let's say I find f prime, right? I find f prime, okay? And it equals whatever. Okay. What slope do I want to have? Three. So how do I find an x value where the slope is three? What will this function tell you? The slope. What do I want the slope to be? Three. So I want to make this come out to b to be equal to three. Right. And we'll solve for x. Okay. But there's a part in between that. So you just call this h equals x plus h cubed. Plus two. That's x cubed plus. Uh, uh, x cubed plus three x squared h three x h squared plus h cubed minus x cubed plus two. Yeah. Over h. Yeah, Limit as h approaches zero. Okay. Let's say we did all that. Let me save us some time. Isn't it only two x squared h? Two x cubed squared max three zero. Uh, I thought so. <laughs> Let's see. Three. Uh, it's no, it's three. Yeah, it's three. It's three. Because it's gonna be. It's gonna be like a two x squared h. Then it's gonna be like a x. Okay. H. So the derivative of this is three x squared. Yeah, that's where it got me. <coughs> so 3x squared equals 3, so x squared equals 1, so x equals? 1. Almost. Plus or minus 1. Okay, so plus or minus 1, we have tangent lines that have a slope of what? 3. 3. 3. three. Okay. Well, I need to find the equations of these, uh, these lines. Okay, there's two of them. There's line 1 and line 2. Line one, uh, it has a slope of three, but what point does it go through? How do you know? Because the, the constant equals constant equals negative four. Oh, are you talking about? I think you're talking about the straight line. I think you're talking about the right line, right? The tangent line to oh, this graph here. Oh, that one. Oh, this okay. graph looks something like this. Uh, that. The one on the right yeah. plus is zero. How do you know? Yeah, because uh, <coughs> in the y equals mx plus b function, uh, b is the y-intercept, and negative 4 is the y-intercept, so it crosses on the y-axis at the right one? This one? Yeah, that one. Oh, 
yeah, but that doesn't matter. Alright, not like the other one. All we wanted from this was its slope. That's uh, that's the only relationship that these lines are going to have. It's parallel. Only has to do with slope. Doesn't matter what the line is. So here's this this tangent line of the slope of three is something like this. This one of the slope of three is something like this. Okay. So how do we find this point that it goes through? What's the x value at that point? Oh, you did the yeah. No, that would be slope. We already had the slope. Can you find the limit? Well, x is 1 here, and x is what? Negative 1 there. Oh, okay. How do you know that? Oh, Right there. So we put negative 1 into the function. Uh, so x equals negative 1, y equals negative 1 cubed plus 2, and that equals 1. So we could use y equals mx plus b. y equals mx plus b. b is equal to 4. Right? And so we have y equals 3x plus 4. Same thing over here. Only x is 1 and not negative 1. And so y is equal to 1 cubed plus 2, which is equal to 3. So y equals m x plus b. So b equals 0. zero. So y equals mx plus b. So y could just be b equal to 3x. Okay. Alrighty. Fasten the homework. I brought my U.S. history book. Oh, our real sucks. Let me help you. Okay. Mm -hmm. We win. We win. Oh. Okay, we get okay. I want you to take a look at those. time here. We, I don't think it'll take long to, to learn this new stuff, but uh, we're going to go ahead and, and go through these kind of quickly. So what does it mean, differentiability? Meaning that something's differentiable. It has an you can derive it. You can derive the slope of that point. Yeah. Right? It does have a slope of a tangent line. <laughs> okay? Which, to put it as simply as possible, it just means that it's possible to find that limit. So, this limit What can we say about that limit if it's differentiable? It exists. It exists. It's got to exist, otherwise, hey, that wouldn't make much sense at all. Okay? Here's a problem we keep coming back to. Okay? Yeah. Dealing with this continuity and all these different things. Alright. Uh, is it continuous at x equals zero? We found out that yes, it is. Is the limit equal to zero? We found out that yes, it is. So now is it differentiable? Does that limit exist? What about that? Yes. Yes, how can we find out? Huh? What equation? Well, that's not an equation. That's a limit. That's a limit. We do have to be technical. So we use the limit, and if we can find that limit, then, well, the limit must exist. Makes sense. Okay. So, let's take a look. The limit as h approaches 0 of uh, x plus h to the 1 third minus x to the 1 third over h. No, we don't want six. No, two six. Two thirds. Two thirds. Hmm? That'd be x. X to the second third. Two, and you go, and you go one plus yeah, x to the power. It's the cube root. It is the cube root. Third root. But it's oh, the second no, value no. on the chain root. No, wait, no, that'd be because it'd be two. Hmm. Let's see. X to second over three. Let's 
was thinking maybe multiply by the cow's dick, but uh, I got a seven That one just for the sake of time, we'll leave that one alone. Good idea. Okay. Um, so here's a, a table that compares time in minutes to the temperature of water that's being heated up. Um, at time t equals zero, the temperature of water is 65 degrees. Clearly, we can see that. Uh, the water is heated for 30 minutes, right? From zero. 20 and we're listening, we're, we're, we don't have data for, you know, at the end. We don't have any data for greater than 20. But we don't even know what they're asking yet. Beginning at, uh, uh, beginning at time equals zero, uh, t equals zero, that's when it's started to be heated up. Values of W of t, W of t, degrees, in, degrees Fahrenheit, the heat, or the, the temperature of the water, at select times t for 20 minutes are given in the table above. Okay, so for 20 minutes they write down these data points. Use the data in the table, so use everything that you have to estimate W prime of 12. What does W of prime of 12? Derivative. Derivative. Uh, which derivative means slope. the slope. The slope that this graph would make, okay? But this is all the information we have about this graph, so. Oh my. So, how would we find the slope of this graph? based on what we know right now at 12, which we don't even have data for. What would be the slope of the graph at 12? We have to do the same thing we did for the ball, didn't we? What's that? We have to do the same thing we did for the ball by trying to find information between the points that we had. Okay, but we don't have any information in between, right? Yeah. And if you, I've discussed with a couple of groups that if you try to find information in between, it, it winds up Same as what? The yeah. yeah. It winds up being on the same slope as as data you actually do have. Right. Can we first try that? Uh, Can we just find the slope of what you think stuff we already have? Yeah, find the slope of, of data we have. Right? What data would you use if you want to find the slope at twelve? At nine and fifteen. At nine and fifteen. How are we gonna find the slope between nine and fifteen? Well if the yeah. So it'd be like nine, and then comma sixty one point eight, and then at fifteen. Okay, so we have we have the points seven. nine comma sixty one point eight, and fifteen comma sixty seven point nine. And then we could do the uh, oh that one is it's point basically point. the f of x plus h minus f of x over h, but it's. Y2 it's the range the it's one more over like y2 minus y1 over x. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, just two points, right? Okay. So 67.9 minus 61.8 over 15 minus 9. Okay. What does that give us? 6.1 over 6. 6.1 over 6? Yeah. What's that give us? 1.016. Okay. 1.016. Repeating? Okay. We found it. We found the slope at 12, or as, as, as best we can approximate. Okay, so show the computation legend to your answer. There they are. Uh, using correct units. What are the units of this slope? Um, minutes and degrees. What's that? Degrees per minute. Degrees Fahrenheit per minute. Okay, so interpret the meaning of your answer in the context of the problem. That's that is how much it is. It heats up per minute. That's how fast it's heating up, that's how many degrees it goes up per minute at that moment in time. <coughs> if we had better data, we could find, you know, closer to what it actually is doing at that time, but from what we know, that's, that's what it is. Right? So, this is, this is all the way at the back of the AP test. It's on the free response. It's the first question on this uh, free response question, and it's just about y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, and understanding that that slope is the rate of change of the two variables.
OK. <coughs> so if I plug t into this function v of t, then what I'll get is the weight of a baby bird at time t. OK? So w prime, w prime, w prime is, the, is the, the value of the derivative at 12, right? Yeah. And the derivative tells you what about the function? The slope. the slope, so we found the slope between these two points, yeah. which is the best we can do, because yeah. we don't have any other data. We don't have a function to take the derivative of. Oh, because it's not like one point. Yeah. Right. right. So all we have is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That's the, the best slope that we can approximate for 12, since 12 is between 9 and 15. Okay, so we're going to get rid of the derivative. Would it ever? Well, that's what, would that, would that what S time will look like? Um, so the zero? So I'll just add everything? The derivative would be flat at that point, yeah. So would it be just that? Would that be the answer then? Would be this would be the answer. This would be the value yeah, of the derivative. This would be the slope. Be, that's what it is for all x's. For all x's between here and there. Okay. As we go on to another one, it would be different. Um, oh, yeah. So b of t tells us the weight of the baby bird at time t. Then the rate at which the baby bird is gaining weight at time t is given by this. So this is how fast the baby bird is gaining weight at time t. OK? All right. So say I uh, figure out what, <coughs> what this is, right? And I get a big number. What would a big number be in the context of this problem? Something about the baby bird. Uh, gaining weight quickly. Quickly. And if it's a small number? Slowly. Right. Okay. So let's see. Is the bird gaining weight faster when the weight is 40 grams or when the weight is 70 grams? Explain your reasoning. So this B right here is its weight. You know? So just plug her in. Plug her in. Okay. So we put in 40. Okay. 60. 100 minus 40, 60 over 5. So it'll be 30. Uh, 60 over 5. Oh, no. 12. 12. Yeah. Okay, then 70. 100 minus 70 is 30. 30 divided by 5 is 6. Is 6. So here we got 12. 12. And here we got 6. six. When is it gaining weight more quickly? At 40 grams. Look at that. It's as easy as that. Okay. So this is a derivative, right? What does that D represent? Different. Difference. We could use it, we could think of it as difference. Difference in the weight over the difference in time. The time. Yeah. A little d really is d for delta, delta for change. Okay. Um, so the function f is defined by this for these x values. What's that? We did a different part of the question, yeah. Um, write an equation for the line tangent to the graph at x equals 3, or x equals negative 3. Well, what do we need in order to write the equation of a line? Y equals negative 3. Negative 3. So we need this guy and this guy. Can we find this? Well, that's f prime, actually. We should be able to find it. Um, yeah, f prime, the derivative, is this. Okay. How do we find the slope? That's that's one way of doing it. Or if we had the derivative, the derivative tells us what? Oh, it's the function is the function that gives you the slope. Plug in the plug negative, negative three, three right in there. Yeah. <laughs> F prime of negative three is negative negative three over the square root of 25 minus negative 3 squared. So 9 over 25 Just 3. Negative negative 3. And then there will be a 16. The square root of 16. So 3 fourths is the slope of this line. So we know this part. Would it be plus or minus? What do you mean, would it be plus or minus? Would it be plus or minus of negative 4 or positive 4? Oh, um, no, because. If it was going to be minus, then, then we, did, we would need to have a minus in front here. Well, see if I can do like negative, if I could do 
x squared is 16 to the power of The one. plus or minus thing is when you're trying to solve an equation and you have something like x squared equals 16. Okay. You're trying to find a number that multiplies by itself to give you 16 which is kind of mysterious at that point. At this point, this is not mysterious as to whether this number is positive or negative. There is a plus out in front. So we'll, we're going to kind of gloss over that point right now. It's good to still be a negative or a positive. The negative or positive is taken care of by assuming that the square root would be positive unless there's a negative in front. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, no, that's not what I wanted to put. Can we plug in a y and an x and find b like we've been doing? Yes. Well, can we plug in m? M is 3 fourths. It's 3 fourths. Can we plug in an x? So that'll be negative 3. Negative 3? Three. Negative three. Oh, yeah. Plus b, can we plug in a y? Uh, what about that? Into the regular function? Into the regular function, that's where the, that point on the line is going to be. Yeah. Negative 3 into here, that's going to be? 16, so it'll be 4. 4. 4 equals 3 fourths times negative 3 uh, plus b, so 4 equals 9 plus uh, 9 fourths equals b equals 25 fourths. So y equals 3 fourths x plus 25 fourths. Wouldn't it be negative 9 fourths? No, it was a negative 9 fourths. Well, this was negative 9 fourths, but then I added 9 fourths to both sides. Okay. This one we'll have to revisit when we have uh, the rules that we're actually going to learn today. Some of them. Okay. I like going through those with you better than yeah. we were doing before. Yeah. It helps out a lot. We always went over them together. Maybe like after. <coughs> I'd like to give you time to the, the, the time that, it, that you spend <coughs> doing everything you possibly could think of is way more valuable than just being shown. I'm going to show you, but it's better for you to struggle. Mm. All right, so we're going to learn some basic rules. Okay? So, and we don't have a ton of time, but it's not going to take that long. We can all just be on board and participate in questions and stuff that I always say. All right. So the first we're going to talk about is the constant rule. That would be the derivative of a constant function. Can you give me an example of a constant function? Eight. Not all lines are constant functions, mm -hmm. but eight is a constant. A function that always tells you eight is the answer would be a constant function. It always tells you eight. Four. Four. Y equals four. Y equals eight. Y equals a. That's a number. Just one number. So, so for example, y equals eight. Y equals four. Y equals any constant. What do these graphs look like? Flat horizontal, flat horizontal lines at 8, at 4, at whatever number we're talking about. Y equals a constant. Okay? So the, the constant rule we're talking about is the derivative of, like, how do we find the derivative of certain kinds of functions? Okay? So what's the derivative of these functions? It's always zero. The slope's always zero. It doesn't matter where you are. The slope will always be zero. So the derivative of, uh, of a constant, let's say, okay. the derivative of 8, the derivative of 4, is always 0. Because if we were to graph these things, they'd just be flat lines. And the slope of a flat line is always going to be 0. Okay. So there's our constant rule. The constant rule is that uh, no matter what, we get a 0 when you take the derivative of a constant. Here's what I want to do. I want to give you several functions. y equals x. y equals x squared. Let's go all the way up to y equals x cubed. OK? And uh, we'll break it into three rows. OK? So this first row, use the limiting process like we've always done so far to find the derivative, the derivative of y equals x. OK, second row, find the derivative of y equals x squared, and the third row find the derivative of y equals x cubed. 
First row right here, derivative of y equals x. Derivative of y equals x squared. Derivative of y equals x cubed. Okay, for the first one, what is y prime? One. one. One, right? The derivative of this function is one. Hey, that's a line. It has a slope of one, and the slope is one. Obviously, the, the function that tells you how big the slope is would always tell you the slope is one, because the slope is always one for that line. Okay. Um, how about this one? Have we found y prime for x squared? Two x. Y prime equals two x here. How about this guy? 3x squared. 3x squared. Okay. I get the feeling that some of you jumped the gun. Okay. Uh, which kind of annoys me when you do that, because if, if you need to know it, I'll tell it to you. Okay. Uh, I want you to, to explore and all that kind of stuff, but don't always be looking for the shortcut. All right? I have a quick question. Yeah. So like, for the y equals x cubed, Yes. Um, we would use like the limit, right? Mm -hmm. And then we go x plus h cubed plus x cubed over h. Is that? Minus x cubed. It's minus x cubed, not? Minus f of x, which is x cubed. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. x plus h minus f of x. Yeah, OK. H. And then you just, okay. so just h cubed minus, uh, cubed. minus x cubed. Or h. Okay. This would be x cubed plus two x squared h plus two x h squared plus h cubed minus x cubed. You forgot it's three x squared. That's three. Because there's like there's that three. So h. Okay. And then uh, we can cancel this h with this h with this h with a couple of these h's, so we'll get three x squared plus three x h plus h squared. H squared. When we let h go to zero. We're just left with 3x squared. Okay. Okay. So let's establish a pattern and we'll call it the power rule. Okay. If you have a variable raised to a power, there's something called the power rule. Let's we'll start here. See this 3? You bring it down in front. As a 3x, how do we get this 2? Power minus 1. Power minus 1. Bring that out in front, and we subtract one, and there's our derivative. Let's see if it works over here. Bring the two down over here. We get two <laughs> times x two. Then what would this power be if we subtracted one? one? Do we need to write that the power is one? No, that's an understood thing. Let's see if it keeps working over here. What's the power here? One. 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 So we bring the power down, and there's a one times x to the. What would this power be if we subtract one? Zero. Does that work? Yeah. What's x yeah. to the 0? 1. 1 times 1, 1. Okay. So the power rule uh, the derivative of x to the n. How would we express this power rule? So, like the instructions are that in the answer I give the instructions for taking the derivative. Um, n, n, there it is, perfect. Bring down the n for the coefficient, and then the exponent is just one less. Let's go back to that, uh, that AP question. It was 
y equals x to the one third, and they wanted to know is it differentiable at x equals zero? Does it have a derivative? Now we can find the derivative we have. It's a power. Any power this will work with. Okay, any power. Um, so we take the derivative of x to the one third. One third x to the negative. That's great. Negative, negative two thirds. Well, if you raise something to a negative power, it goes to the denominator. Goes to the denominator. So we can write it this way: one third. Let's say one over three times x to the two thirds. Okay. So if we want to know if this is differentiable at zero, well, then there there would have to be. The derivative. The derivative would have to be defined at zero. Let's look at the derivative. Is the der derivative defined at zero? How do we find the derivative at a certain point? We find it slow. We plug in the point zero. One over three times well, what's zero to the two thirds? Zero. Zero. What's three times zero? Zero. One over zero? Undefined. Undefined. So if we were to go back to that AP question, we would say. Is it differentiable at zero? No. No, it's not differentiable at zero. So let's jump back there. It's not differentiable at zero. Is it continuous? Yeah, we said it was already. Is, does the limit exist? Is it equal to zero? Is the limit equal to zero? Yes. Does it have a derivative? Is it differentiable? No. No. So we can answer this question fully now. One and two only. One and, oh, that says three. Um, one and, yeah, one and three only. Two is not equal to three. One and three only. I was what? I missed the bit where you said it was not differential. It's not differential because there is no derivative at zero. Um, oh, okay. One of the derivative at zero would plug zero in. Yeah. So the question, is it differentiable at that point? We could also just interpret that as, does the derivative exist? Is it a real number? Does it exist? Yeah? So differentiable is if the derivative exists. If something's differentiable, you can find its derivative. You can find its slope. Okay. If it's the derivative is continuous. But well, that means the derivative would have to be continuous, which this is not. Um, it and yeah, the derivative would have to be continuous. Um, and you know, functions can have derivatives. This has a derivative, but sometimes the derivative will not be continuous. There'll be a place where it's not defined. Okay. <coughs> okay. Now we have the constant multiple rule. Constant multiple rule. So that rule, I'll just start out by saying what the rule is, is that any constant <coughs> times a function, okay. if this is a function you can find the derivative of, then you just take the derivative of that function and multiply it by c. So there's a simple one, the derivative of 4x squared. That's just equal to 4 <laughs> times the derivative of x squared. What's the derivative of x squared? We know that now down, subtract 1, 2x, 4 times 2x, that's 8x. Okay. We do some of these simple power rules, one with the constant multiple rule, and we find pretty quickly that so you can just bring this down, multiply it by the coefficient that's already there, subtract one from the power, and there's our derivative. Okay. This will always work no matter what this function is. If it's just multiplied by a constant, we'll multiply the constant by the derivative. Bless you. We multiply constants to a function and also look the same way. A constant times a function, the derivative of that would be a constant times the derivative of whatever that function is. Um, Okay, so now this right here, this rule is the thing that brings it all together. Before, if I wanted to take the derivative of 
2x cubed minus x squared plus 3, that would be kind of a long process. I'd have to take the limit. I'd have to put x plus h into all those x's, then I'd have to expand them all out, and then I'd have to subtract f of x, and then I'd have to take it over h, and then do all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. But the sum and difference rule says that the derivative of f of x plus or minus, the sum and difference rules work very similar. <coughs> Well, that's just the derivative of f plus or minus the derivative of x. If you're adding two functions together, you take the derivative. The way you take the derivative is take the derivative of each of them separately and just add them together. If you're subtracting two of them, take the derivative minus the derivative. Okay? Hmm. <coughs> um, which is a really nice thing. It's really convenient that that, that, that happens. Not too surprising because if you were to do this by the limiting process, you'd get 2 times x plus h cubed uh, minus x squared plus 3 minus, or sorry, x plus h squared. x plus h squared minus uh, 2x cubed minus x squared plus 3 over h. Well, if we distribute this negative, and rearrange things, we can get 2 times x plus h cubed minus 2x cubed over h. Will that be the derivative of 2x cubed? Okay. Uh, minus, uh, oh, I guess we'll say plus, negative x plus h squared plus uh, x squared over h. That's just the derivative of x squared. Uh, or of negative x squared, um, plus 3 minus 3 over h. That's 0. That's just the derivative of 3, a constant function. Right? We could kind of group these things together in the numerator in such a way uh, that we could split them all apart because they're just all going to be fractions with the common denominator h. And here we have derivative plus the next derivative plus the next derivative. So for this one, to find f prime, we look at the first function. What's the derivative of 2x cubed? 6x uh, squared. Down, 6x squared. Because by the constant multiple rule, we can just bring this down. 3x squared. You take 3x squared, multiply by 2, and you get 6x squared. Minus the derivative of x squared? 6. Plus? 3. Ooh, 0. 0. Six. Six minus two. So you can see in, when you're taking derivatives, that at the very end you have this constant term. Like, oh. doesn't okay. contribute to the derivative. Yeah. Wait, what? <laughs> okay, why is that three zero though? Because of the constant. Because of the constant rule and also, look, these are three separate functions. We're adding them together. Yeah. Right? This function is this cubic function. It's that uh, curvy thing with maybe two. Uh, Lumps like that, you know, a maximum and a minimum. It might look something like that. Uh, so here's like a here's a parabola, an upside down parabola, right? Uh, and here's a constant. So the derivative of this, we find a six x squared. The derivative of this is negative two x. The derivative of a constant function, we talked about the horizontal line, right? So the derivative is always zero. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's the sum and the difference. Sum and difference rule. Right. Well, the derivative of the sine of x is the cosine of x. The derivative of the cosine of x is negative sine x. Let's just real quickly. Uh, look at that and see if we're convinced by looking at a picture. For the last thing to do, I'm going to have someone come up. We're talking about the derivative of the sine function. There's the sine function right there. And we're talking about the derivative of it, which tells what does the derivative tell about the function? Okay. So I want somebody to come up, and in this pinkish color, I want you to put just a dot, okay, one point that's going to be on the derivative of the sine function. Remember, the derivative tells you the slope. So if you look at the sine function, 
see what the slope should be at some point. We should be able to say what the derivative would be. So a single point that would be on the derivative. Just that one point on it? Just one. So on that graph. So we're like going to start kind of graphing the derivative on top of the sine function. Um, Good. You see what Aaron did there? No. Not at all. Okay, so he's picking this point over here. Okay. Apparently, according to him, what is the value of the derivative at this point? Zero. 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 The y value is zero. That means that the value of the derivative is zero. Uh, well, then what's he saying about the original function if the derivative is zero? The slope, slope is zero. Do you believe it? Yeah. Sure. Is the slope zero? Yeah. Yeah, it looks flat to me. Right? Can somebody else come up and put another point that's on the derivative? No. There's one. Huh. Somebody do another one? Ah, okay. That's that's creative, right? So let's go ahead and take away all these. <laughs> those are getting to be pretty clear, right? So why'd you choose this? Um because it's slow. Good. It's at the highest point, right? And how big does that slope look like it is? One. One. One seems reasonable. It turns out you're right. It is one. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Oh. Could you do the? Oh. Huh? Oh, I only one half. Could you do the bottom of that again? The same way. It's the minimum. Show us. Like the opposite of this, like right here. Well, now you're saying the slope is also this value. It can't be both those values at the same time, right? And you're saying that the slope is negative? Is there a place up here that the slope is negative? Yes. Yes. Where at? Can you point to a place on the on this guy where the slope is negative? Yes, yes, yes. And where's the biggest negative slope you can find? Say in here, where's the biggest negative slope you can see? That's a zero. This isn't much bigger. How about this? This is the steepest it's going to get. So, you're right. There is a negative slope. Okay? So, if we were to keep doing this and connect all these points through here and there and there and max out there and come back down through there, what's this starting to look like? The cosine. The derivative of the cosine. Alright, have a good day. Derivative of the cosine is the sine. Derivative of the sine is the cosine. Wait, why is it negative sine? Why is it like that though? The sine would be negative. Taking the derivative of the cosine.